Hello, I'm Hamish Bowles, international editor-at-large of American Vogue, and I'm here to tell you everything you need to know about the IT bag. You are either IT or you are not. The status bag has long been in existence. From the Hermes Kelly, a practical, structured classic that was subsequently named for Grace Kelly, who used hers to hide her baby bump, and that has proved enduringly popular, to Chanel's quilting and Gucci's bamboo-handled number, a bag born out of post-war shortages that went on to make a worldwide splash on the arm of Ingrid Bergman. But in the 90s, the concept of the it bag was reborn. There was a perfect storm, an ideal set of conditions. Let's begin with the Dior bag, initially called Shu Shu, that debuted in 1995. Each bag was handmade, from the charms to the Dior letters. 140 separate pieces. The bag truly gained popularity when it was given to Diana, Princess of Wales, by France's First Lady, Bernadette Chirac. Diana was the most photographed woman in the world, and so the chouchou became the most photographed bag. In 1996, Dior renamed the bag in honour of Diana, the Lady Dior. Fast on its heels, in 1997, came the Fendi Baguette, the little bag that sat under your arm like the French carry their loaves. Its restrained, slim shape was offset by its dizzying array of colours and materials, from plain to beaded, sequin to exotic. It was in stark contrast to the minimalist designs popular around this time and made the bags infinitely collectible. And it didn't hurt that it made a memorable appearance on the arm of a trend-setting TV character. It's a baguette. With the creation of the baguette, Fendi proposed a completely different type of bag to the one that had dominated the market for years. The Prada Nylon Backpack that debuted in 1984. Here, functionality took a backseat to exclusivity. Possessing it was now more important than using it. It generated waiting lists at big department stores, which in turn created buzz about the bag. This was an idea that spread through the 90s. The wait list something not always completely organic. The rise in power of designers was another sea change in the 90s. Designers had gone from small family or individually owned houses to becoming star attractions at major corporations. At the turn of the 90s, John Galliano was couch surfing in Paris, designing what he could with what he had, before being hired as the creative director of Givenchy in 1995, and a year later, the creative director of Dior. There, he found the infrastructure he needed to design fashion on a global scale. Marketing, mass production, worldwide distribution. And with those tools, he created an icon. The unconventionally shaped Dior saddlebag debuted on the runway in Galliano's spring-summer 2000 collection for the house. Unlike other bags meant to be worn in the crook of the carrier's arm, the saddlebag, with its short straps and kidney shape, fit snug under the arm. Celebrities were drawn to the bag and photos of them carrying it spread around the world. And of course, another Carrie Bradshaw endorsement up the bag's profile. Balenciaga's Lariat, aka City Bag, aka Motorcycle Bag, is the it bag that almost didn't get produced. In 2001, Balenciaga designer Nicolas Guesquier crafted a prototype of a bag that seemed simple, just hardware and luxury leather. But it was unlike other bags of the era for a number of reasons. At the time, luxury leather's most common use was in a fixed, rigid structure. But the moto bag was soft and flexible. Yet another notable difference from bags at the time. There was no logo. After Kate Moss and several other models fawned over the prototype in his studio, Guesquier famously decided to go ahead and produce 25 more. He gifted them to Moss and her fellow models, and the powers that be were finally convinced, and the motorcycle bag went on to be an enduring bestseller. But for all the sensational bags being produced, many fell short of becoming it bags. Designers had to constantly innovate to stay ahead of the crowd. Marc Jacobs, then at Louis Vuitton, took things one step further to make sure his bag stood out, collaborating with major artists. First with Stephen Sprouse and the graffiti bag, 
Then, in a partnership with the artist Akashi Murakami, he recreated the classic LV monogram in 33 colors on a black or white background. Jacobs allowed Murakami even more say than Sprouse in the ultimate design, giving the artist explicit permission to subvert the brand guidelines. Jacob described the bag as a monumental marriage of art and commerce, and Murakami's work became one of the most in-demand accessories on the market. By this time, you couldn't open a magazine without seeing a celebrity flaunting an it bag. For a long time, models were looked at as the purveyors of fashion trends. But somewhere around the 90s, celebrities began taking models' places on women's magazine covers. But more than that, it was a time when the internet was bringing celebrity style to our daily attention, and e-commerce eventually made buying their looks easy and convenient, if not cheap. Phoebe Philo, designer at Chloe, observed all this and took it to the next level. Instead of releasing a bag and hoping celebrities in the limelight would be drawn to it, the Chloe Paddington was strategically gifted to celebrities who couldn't step outside without being photographed. Instantly recognizable for its logo padlock, it rapidly claimed cult status. In 2005, Chanel designer Karl Lagerfeld took a very different approach. Instead of starting from scratch, he created a reissue of the very popular quilted chain handle flat bag, originally designed by Coco Chanel for her February 1955 Haute Couture collection. Creating exact replicas of a 50-year-old iconic bag was risky, but paid off. The reimagined classic proved to be an immense success with a whole new generation. But perhaps what Lagerfeld most notably achieved here was opening the eyes of the big brands to the power of nostalgia and legacy. Today, it's exponentially harder for one bag to dominate a season and rise to the it bag status. There are faster cycles in fashion now, for one thing, and even concurrent fads. With a dynamic new generation of creative directors at the helm of legacy brands, Alessandro Micheli at Gucci, Demna Vasalia at Balenciaga, J.W. Anderson at Loewe, and Daniel Lee at Bottega Veneta, to name but a few, all hard at work reimagining historic classics and creating new must-haves, the next it bag could be coming from anywhere at any time. <laughs>